chapter 10 this morning. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. I want to read for you verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. So if you have your, your outlines or your devices or your Bibles, you can follow along. Or you can just look up here at the screen because we are spoiled here. Amen? Amen. 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 Somebody does a lot of work for us to have all this in. We thank God for him. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. So, John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. This is what the word of God says. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Amen. This is the word of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We want to speak from this subject today. The Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. John chapter 10 has been piggybacked off of John chapter 9, which we encountered on last week. That was a man born blind. Jesus had just been in a conversation with the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders. And they were upset with Jesus to the point where they wanted to stone him and kill him. But Jesus made himself disappear in the crowd and as he was leaving out of the synagogue he saw a man sitting there begging born blind so Jesus' disciples asked him the question uh, who sinned his mother or his father that he was born blind Jesus said no one sinned but this man has been sat here today so that the works of God, the power of God may be manifested in his life. And so listen, sometimes we go through things in life so that God can come along and manifest his power. God can come along and do a work in our life so that others may see the work and others may be drawn to God and they may receive the salvation of God. But Jesus heals this man. And the Pharisees are upset because Jesus healed the man. Yeah. Yeah. They're mad because Jesus done a work in his life that they could not do. And sometimes folks are just so jealous of what God is doing in your life that they cannot stop and celebrate with you. Instead, they oppose you. Because we found out about this man last week that there is an opportunity for healing, there is obedience for healing, and there is opposition for healing. And these men oppose Jesus Christ. They oppose the man. And so the religious leaders had shown such cruel and unhelpful attitude toward the blind, the blind man, even his parents, that they even threatened the parents not to Accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah or else they will be kicked out of the synagogue. So, so these rulers were so cruel to the common people, to the folks who would come there and worship. So Jesus found it necessary to talk to them about the contrast between his leadership and their leadership. A true and a godly shepherd and an ungodly shepherd. And that's when we come to chapter 10 today. He is going to show them what a good shepherd looks like compared to what they are a bad and an ungodly shepherd. The good shepherd. John chapter 10. 
Jesus begins to speak to these Pharisees. He said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in over the wall or any other way, is a thief and a robber. Because sheep were held in this pen and they, it was all stones and sometimes they would put, you know, thorns on the top so that the sheep won't climb in and so other folks can climb in. But there were some imposters that would climb in and take someone's sheep that did not own, that they did not belong to them. And so Jesus is saying that there are some leaders who did not come to leadership the right way. They have climbed over. And, and, and you can look throughout churches today and you can tell who God has called to be a pastor and who God has not called to be a pastor. Because some of them just ordained themselves. Some of them just claim it for themselves. And some of them, they, they, they get in by way of religion. They get in by way of works. They get in by way of lineage. And so they think that they have the right to be a leader because they have done some work. Yeah, yeah. But Jesus said, this is not the way to come in. You, you have not come in the proper way. And if you have come in any other way, then you are a thief and a robber. I love Jesus using these two words. Because a thief is someone who comes and takes the property of someone else. They just come in and they take it. There are some leaders who are taking from God's people and they are not giving to God's people. There are some who are just taking God's uh, rightful place as a leader, as a pastor, as a shepherd, and God is not pleased with it. They're robbing God by robbing God's sheep. But, but, but that's the thief. But, but the robber is someone who steals just like a thief. But he uses threat and violence and intimidation. They, they, they bully them. And listen, I know some pastors who, who just bully their flock. I know some leaders who are bullies. I know some folks on the job who think that they earn respect by intimidation. And these people are going about it the wrong way. And, and Jesus wants to let them know it's not about robbing. It's not about stealing. It's not about taking what's not yours. It's not about intimidation. It's all about how a great shepherd and a good shepherd carries himself. It's not about intimidation. A good shepherd comes the right way. Verse number two, he says this. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he has brought them all out, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 5, but they will not follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. And every time I've heard this passage preach, you know what they say about sheep? They dumb. They're just dumb animals. But I want to challenge that because what I just read lets me know that sheep are intelligent. We are not the sheep of God saying that we're dumb and we'll follow anybody. No, no. We are intelligent. The sheep know exactly who the shepherd is. You can learn two things from a sheep from this. First of all, the sheep listen. The sheep listen. They know the voice of the shepherd. We know the voice of God. We know who Jesus Christ is. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We know exactly who he is. And so we listen. But also you can know this about a sheep. A sheep is loyal. You don't, they don't just follow anybody. Just anybody can't come and tell me something and expect for me to accept their word and for me to just follow them, for me to just listen. No, sheep have some intelligence. We know exactly who God is. 
and the real followers of Jesus Christ, we know a false shepherd from the true shepherd. If you're not displaying a Christ-like quality, if you don't have a Christ-like love, if you're not walking in Christ-like obedience, then we are not following you. This is what else he said. He said that he calls them by name. It's amazing the relationship that a shepherd has with a sheep. Because when he calls their name, they listen. Historical books say that, that they would always name their sheep. They, they, knew, they would give them a name and they knew exactly who was calling them because the sheep would come. I found out it's a bad idea to name farm animals as a child. I spent the summer in Lubbock, Texas with uh, uh, my, my Aunt Willie and my Uncle Bunny and they had chickens in the backyard so it was me and my cousin Edward and so I fell in love with the chickens. I named them all. And so my older cousin Ed, when, when my grandmother and, and, and Aunt Willie went out to grab the chicken and kill it and I was crying for Chester because Chester now was going to be dinner. And as we were eating dinner, my cousin kept saying, well, Chester, show tastes good. <laughs> my heart was broken. I'm crying. But, but I had a relationship yeah, yeah. with the chickens. <laughs> Shepherds have a relationship with the sheep. They, they know their name. The shepherd would come in and say, hey, hey, Tito, Jermaine, you know, Jackie, Maul, and Michael. You, he, and they would come running. Some of y'all don't know that's the Jackson 5. I was a Jackson 5 fan. And, and, and the sheep would come running out because they knew the shepherd's voice. They're intelligent animals. They wouldn't listen to a stranger for nothing. They wouldn't follow him at all. And, and the thing about it is, it says that he goes out before them. See, in the Western world, we know and we're known for, 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 for rustling and herding a flock. But in the Eastern, they shepherd them. They led them. They walked out before them and they followed them. They wasn't rude. They wasn't harsh. They, they, didn't, they didn't chase them. They were, they were not hitting them like we do over here. They would just walk out after they call their name and they would follow them. This is the sign of a good shepherd. But as Jesus was saying this to them, they didn't understand. Why? Because they didn't understand Jesus. And they didn't want to understand Jesus. They wanted Jesus to be more like them. They did not want to be like Jesus. They thought that Jesus should follow their footsteps because they were Pharisees and they were a part of this great section of, of Jewish religion heritage. But he came in to change the way that they were doing things because religion is not the way to Jesus Christ. It's through a relationship to God, to Christ Jesus. It is not by your, your old way of life, your ancestors or whatever you've been going through or, or even following the footsteps of a parent. No, you have to have your own relationship with Christ. Jesus tells them about a shepherd. Jesus tells them about this gate that sheep would come in and out. And, and, and listen, then Jesus go ahead on and he informs them this. He said, as a matter of fact, I am the gate. See, 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 Jesus is the gate. And, and what they would do in that day is that they would build this enclosure. But there was really no gate there. But the gatekeeper or the shepherd would lay in front of the gate so that no one can get in and no one's sheep can get out. Because at night, everybody's sheep would be in there. Mm -hmm. It would be my sheep. It would be your sheep. It would be someone else's sheep. But the sheep would not come out unless the gatekeeper allowed the shepherd in. Right. And once the shepherd came in and he called their names, 
Only his sheep followed him out. No one else sheep. And so he would sit there and Jesus say, I am the gate. He says, verse, 20, verse 7, Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pastures. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. Jesus said, I'm the gate. If you come through me, you have salvation, you have protection, you have security if you come through me. This is, this is the same thing that Jesus is going to say in John chapter 14. If you keep on reading through your Bible, you'll see in John chapter 14 when Jesus was about to die and his disciples were distressed and they were confused and they were afraid, Jesus comforted them, although he was the one that was about to be crucified. He told them, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. He said, I am the way. Jesus is telling them, you're trying to teach them that the way to God is through the rules. The way to God is through self-righteousness. The way to God is by following the law. He said, no, the way to God is through me and me alone. He said, I am the gate. I let people in. I am the one who lead them to the green pastures. I am the one who restores their soul. I am the one. He said, but these thieves, these robbers, these folks who come before me to set up this religious section, they are only there to steal, kill, and destroy. They have no idea that they're working for Satan. They have no idea that they're not doing the work of the Lord. But they are oppressing the people and mistreating the people. And they are hurting them more than they're helping them. But he said, I have come to give them life and life to the full. I've, I've come to bring them life. Not death, not destruction. I'm not here to steal from them. I'm here to be a blessing to their life. This is what good shepherds do. Good shepherds come in and they are there to do a great work for the Lord. But Jesus says in this, uh, I am the gate. But he also tells him this, that he is the good shepherd. See, because Jesus is the good shepherd. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. He said, I I am the good shepherd. So if that's a good shepherd, then that means that's what? That's bad shepherds. He said, I'm nothing like anybody else. I'm nothing like you've ever seen. I'm nothing like any leader you have ever seen in your life. I am the good shepherd. And, and, And here... It is the word kalos, K-A-L-O-S. In the Greek, it means good. It means nice. It means fair. It means kind. It means attractive. He said, the reason why the folks are flocking to me, because I'm a different shepherd than you are. I'm good to them. I'm fair to them. I don't mistreat them. I don't want to stone them for every single little thing that they have done. See, in Christ Jesus, as first and second and third time chances. Listen, some of us have had a million chances to do things better. And the shepherd keeps saying, come on home. 
That's how loving and kind he is. That the shepherd would give us time and time again to get it right. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders, they were so harsh to the people. No one trusted them. No one really wanted them around. And no one would go around them. Why? Because all they would do was beat them down. The man who was called in the act of adultery. The, the woman, excuse me, who was called in the act of adultery. They didn't bring the man, did they? They only brought the woman. But the Old Testament says... If the man and the woman is caught in adultery, they both should be stoned. But all they've done is brought the woman. My take on it is the man probably was a Pharisee. <laughs> it's amazing what leaders get away with. But then those of us who want leaders, we get crucified for every single little thing that we do. And when they brought the woman to Jesus, they said, hey, she should be stoned. Jesus put his head down. He began to write in the dirt and they all begin to leave. So he sat up. He looked at the woman. He said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, they're not here, sir. She said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. You, you, you see the chances that he gives? But they wanted to kill her, but Jesus wanted to give her life. He gave her a chance to get it right. Let me tell you, Jesus is trying to give us a chance to get it right. Whatever you have done wrong, Jesus is giving us a chance to do it right. Why? Because he is the good shepherd. He's good, he's nice, he's fair, he's kind, he's attractive. People are drawn to him. Why? Because he's not a harsh shepherd. He doesn't drive them. He doesn't mistreat them. He leads them. He's the great leader. Verse 14, he says it again. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and, they, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus compares his relationship to, to, uh, to the sheep with the relationship between him and God. Because there is a love bond between God and Christ that will never be broken. And that should be a love bond, a relationship, an agape love between us and the shepherd, between us and Jesus Christ, between us and our Savior, our Lord, that nothing can break. Don't let hard times break up you and Jesus. Because Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. You leave him. Don't let depression. Don't let people. Don't let folks who dislike you. Don't let money. Don't let poorness. Don't let loss of job. Don't let a divorce. Don't let an attitude. Let nothing take you away from God. He said, my sheep know me. And I know them. He said, I know my father and my father knows me. And, and, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He said, there are other sheep that are not in this pen. See, see the fold that he's talking about is the nation of Israel. They are the sheep that he's talking about right now. They are also in this sheepfold. The, the nation of, of Israel is the sheepfold that he's talking about. They are the sheep. God is the shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He said, but there's some other sheep that are not in this fold. That one day I will unite them all. And they only have one shepherd. In one pen. He's talking about the Gentile nation. Because Jews did not believe that Gentiles could be a part of the family of God. 
They thought that they were so ungodly and that they did not have the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that they could not know God, they could not love God, and they could not be saved. They still had that Jonah mentality. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to these cruel and ungodly and evil people who invented crucifixion. And Jonah said, I ain't going. Them people crazy, they don't deserve to be saved. It's no way I'm going to go and preach a gospel message to them and they be saved. Jonah, ultimately, he wanted them to just die. Yeah. So he ran from God. He got swallowed up by the great fish that God created. The great fish swim from one side of the ocean to the other side to where Jonah needs to be and spit him out so that Jonah can go and preach the gospel. The evil, ungodly people heard the word of God and were saved. Because the word of God yes. goes out yeah, yeah. and it never returns void. It will, yes. it will accomplish exactly what God That's wants it. it to accomplish. That's it. That's it. Amen. That's it. The Jews didn't think that Gentiles could be saved. And here Jesus is tell them, telling them, there are some that are not Jewish. There are some who are not a part of the, the Israelite family, but yet they are my sheep also. They found that out when the woman uh, at the well, the Samaritan woman, how she went back and told everybody, and she lived an ungodly life, but God, but Christ spoke a word into her life. She went and told everybody, come and see a man who know everything about me. He must be the Messiah. Everybody came. They heard the word of God, and they said, we don't just believe by her testimony now. We believe because we heard for ourselves, come and stay with us. Jesus stayed in that town for three days, teaching and preaching and loving, and folks were being saved and healed. He said, Gentiles will be saved too. And, 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 and aren't you excited that he brought us in? Because without Jesus Christ, there will be no salvation for us. That will be Jews and Jews only. But everybody here who is not a Jew, you are a Gentile. And God has brought you into the family because of what Jesus has done. Because of his saving power. Because of his death on the cross. And he has saved us. He said, the reason my father loves me is because I lay down my life. Only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And authority to take it back up again. This command I have received from my father. Jesus said listen I can do whatever I want to do. I'm going to die for the sheep. But not because someone has the power to kill me. Because they don't. I lay my own life down. I lay my life down. Everybody who God had something for them to do, they ran from it. Moses didn't want to go. Abraham didn't want to go. Uh, many of them did not. Jonah didn't want to go. But when it was time for Jesus to come to earth and die for us, he said, I will go and lay my life down. He said, I'll go and do it. I'm going to die for their sins so that they can live through me. Amen. So Jesus tells them this whole story about a, a, a good shepherd and a gatekeeper. Then he tells them, as a matter of fact, I am the gate. Mm -hmm. I am the shepherd. By Jesus proclaiming to be the gate and the shepherd, what he's saying, in, in other words, is that he is everything that we need for salvation. You don't need anything else. Yeah. You don't need religion. Some religions teach that you have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to be baptized. That's work salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some say you have to, you know, you have to be rich. You don't have to be. If you're sick, then you're not saved. That's a problem because everybody gets sick. As long as you're in this flesh, you will have some problems in your life. Yeah. Because sin brought sickness. Yeah, yeah. But Jesus is saying, I'm all you need. I am all you need. 
I'm the gate and I'm the shepherd. I let you in and I protect you. I take care of you coming and going. I'm everything that you need. Verse 19 says this, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is a demon possessed and raving mad. And said, this man is crazy and he's possessed by a demon. Why are we listening to him? But verse 21 said, but others said, these are not the sayings of a possessed, uh, uh, of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They say that that's some confusion here because I don't see a demon possessed man. I see a man who's doing the work of God. And others are saying, this man is crazy. But they say, look at the works that he's doing. John the Baptist was saying the same thing like, hey, can somebody go and ask Jesus, is he the one or, or should we be expecting someone else? Jesus didn't say yes or no. Jesus said, you go back and you tell John. That the blind see. Yeah. That the sick are healed. Yeah. Yeah. That the lame yeah. walk. Yeah. 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 And you decide for yourself, am I the one? Nobody has done what Jesus has done. And nobody can do what Jesus can do. Only Jesus can bring salvation. Yeah. 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 Only Jesus can open the eyes of the blind physically and spiritually. Only Jesus can make a way out of no way. Only Jesus can be a bridge over troubled water. Only Jesus can save the souls of people who are perishing and going to hell. So listen, if you desire to be a leader like Jesus... If you did not get it through those passages, I want to give them to you one by one so you can see the lessons from a good shepherd, so you can see how to be a great leader. Listen, whether you want to be a great parent, you can learn how to be a great leading parent through Jesus Christ. A great preacher, a great teacher, a great child, because Jesus was obedient to his father. A great shepherd. Because Jesus leads by example. Here's four lessons you can learn from a shepherd. The first thing is, is, is this, that you have to be a frontline leader. Jesus is that frontline leader. It said that the good shepherd, he does what? He goes ahead of them. True shepherd leads, they lead from the front, not the back. Like a great army general, they are the first ones to go out and they will fight and lead their men. If the general is afraid to go fight, then the men won't fight. David was such a great warrior. He was always the front line. Listen, he was ready to fight. Except for the one time he stayed back and got caught with Bathsheba. Now that, I don't know what David was thinking. But he got himself in trouble. But normally he's on the front line. Yeah. Great leaders on the front line. Yeah. Jesus Christ goes before us. Yes. He's out there. He's fighting our battle. He's yeah. saved our soul. He's praying for us. Yeah. And listen, and he is there on the front line. Real leaders we lead from the front. Yeah. We don't sit back in our office and tell others, you do this, you do that. No. We are out there working with you. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm not afraid to, to get in with the people of God. You will see me mopping. You will see me vacuuming. You will see me packing chairs. I do whatever I need to do in the house of God. Amen. Because I lead from the front. I'm a front line leader. Great leaders lead from the front. Hey, hey, here's the second lesson. Is that... We have to be blessing leaders. We're not here to rob or to steal. 
We're not thieves. We bless because we have come to, to, to bless their life. Listen, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Yeah. Jesus didn't come to take from them. Jesus came to bless them. The purpose of the leader is to bless, not to take, to feed, to strengthen, to encourage. That's what we do. We're not there to take. Amen. We're not there to mistreat. Mm -hmm. We're there to encourage. Encourage. We're there to feed. We're there to strengthen. And I'm going to tell you, Ezekiel the 34th chapter is a great chapter for you to read about shepherds. Because God is telling Ezekiel to tell the shepherd leaders of Israel that he is not pleased with them. He said, y'all not going to find a lost sheep. Y'all not feeding them. Y'all not bandaging up their wounds. You're not encouraging them. You're not leading them. As a matter of fact, all you're doing is getting fat off of them. You just eat their meat. You wear their hide. All you do is you take from the sheep. You're just taking. And there's a lot of pastors who are taking. And I don't talk bad about pastors, but but I am discouraged by some of the things that they do. Like, I don't believe that a pastor should just take half of the money that the church takes in. I, I don't think a pastor who's already on salary should have five or six past anniversaries and gain more money than the church takes in. I have a problem with that. If you're already on salary, why do you need all of those anniversary events to give you more and more money? You're not blessing, you're fleecing. You're not giving, you're taking. I would rather see a pastor ride first class on a, in, 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 a, in an airplane than to have his own private jet. And cost the church $6.8 million to have his own private jet where him and his family can do whatever they want to do and go anywhere they want to go. See, that's not blessing. That's only taking. That, 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 that's not... Being a blessing uh, pastor that is taking. But but listen, let me me move on because I I feel some way about that. Listen, frontline leaders, blessing leaders, and we also should be sacrificial leaders. Jesus said, I lay my my life down for the sheep. And I believe that a shepherd should lay his life down. I believe that a pastor should lay down, a pastor should sacrifice. I'm not saying that you should go out and die for people. Jesus already died for us. What I'm saying is, sacrifice your time. Stop being so busy. A pastor that, that, that you cannot contact, that you cannot talk to, is not a sacrificial pastor. If, he, if he's too busy, then it's a problem. Sacrifice your time, your attention. Be there for the people who need you. We have to be, we have to sacrifice for them. And everybody know, anybody who calls me, I am available. My number goes out to the members. You can call me anytime. And if I don't answer, just leave a message and I will call you back. I'm not untouchable. I know some pastors who will not let the people even touch them. After they finish preaching, there's people who surround them. They say, oh, no, don't touch the pastor. The anointing is on him. Like, what? I'm anointed too by the same Holy Spirit as you. Why can't I come and shake my pastor's hand? It's a problem. Stay away from him. He's too holy right now. Wait till he comes down from the mountain. Just weird stuff. I had a cousin who used to do that. He would preach. He like, you know, nobody can touch me right now. I'm like, well, you kind of crazy anyway. 
But we should be available. We should, they should be able to touch us. Sacrifice. Be that for them. I know a man who was contemplating suicide. And all he wanted to do was talk to his pastor to be encouraged. He told the pastor secretary, listen, I, I, I'm in a bad place and I'm thinking about killing myself and I need to talk to my pastor. She told the pastor, pastor say, listen, I can set up for a meeting with him, but I won't, I won't be available for another four months. Man, I'm about to kill myself right now. You're telling me four months? So the pastor called, the, the, the young man called me and he was a pastor. He is a pastor now. The young man called me and we talked about it. And, uh, and, the, and we prayed, and so he said, man, I feel much better. I told him, I said, change your church. It's a problem. Change your church. And he did, but he's a great pastor right now. Great, great pastor. Hey, here's the last one. We, we shouldn't just be frontline and blessing and sacrificial, but we should be relational pastors. Have a relationship. Jesus said he knows his sheep. And the sheep know him. True leaders have a relationship with the flock. We have to make ourselves available. We have to be there for them. You got to have a relationship with them. You can't be untouchable. You have to be able to be approachable. Jesus was so approachable. Anybody can come up to him. Yeah. He was talking to him. People come up and say, Jesus, my, my daughter is sick. A woman just wanted to go and touch the hem of his garment. People were always coming up to Jesus because he made himself approachable. If you want to learn how to be a good leader, a good parent, a great manager on your job, read about the life of Jesus Christ how he was the good shepherd and how he made himself available to the people. He did not push anybody away, not even children. He said, let the children come. Yeah, don't push them away. As a matter of fact, he said, if you are not like these children, you, you're not, you're not entering the, the kingdom of God. Children are so free spirit, they, they just come, they got questions, they loving. If you are not like little children, you're not welcome to the kingdom of God. I don't know how your leadership is, but I'm praying that you can learn from the leadership of Jesus Christ to be a good shepherd, not a bad shepherd, that you may be loving welcoming, inviting, frontline, blessing, sacrificial, and relational. Because the good shepherd is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that somebody will make him their Savior today. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise.